Hello and welcome to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and today we are speaking with Danielle Dulski. She is the author of Woman Most Wild, Three Keys to Liberating the Witch Within. Danielle is an author, artist, teacher, and a writer, and she's a longtime activist for wild woman spirituality and the Divine Feminine's Return. She leads women's circles, witchcraft workshops, energy healing trainings, and basic and advanced yoga teacher trainings. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Thank you, Marie. Very happy to be here. Thanks for being with us today. And now this is not going to air for a few more days, but we both just found out that Mm -hmm. Louise Hay, the founder of Hay House Publishing, who has published many authors who've been on Synchronicity, she passed away this morning. So I just wanted to acknowledge that for anyone who is sad about the news or missing her. Um, She impacted so many lives. She's leaving a tremendous legacy. If anyone could be here to live what you would consider a full life, it was Louise Hay. I just am taking that with me right now. But I know that a lot of people are feeling really, really sad um, about the news. And so I just want to send my condolences to everyone who is grieving that loss of of her presence. So Danielle, we'll we'll jump in. Um, I want to ask you about witchcraft and your book, Woman Most Wild. But since we're on the topic of passing over, transition, death... From your background in, I believe you you come from an evangelical Christian background as a child, and then mm-hmm. uh, you consider yourself a, a, a witch, and we'll talk about what that means. But I'm just wondering what your views are, are around death and dying. Yeah, um, I mean, it's uh, autumn's the season of, of the great death ritual that we all miss in our society, right? So... Um, it's uh, the cycle of death and rebirth. I think, you know, that's kind of the realm of, of the crone priestess or the witch. So it's, you know, these pieces of the feminine that we're really missing in our society. Um, but I, I, I think that there's always kind of a, a collective grief in, in autumn. And um, I can talk a little bit about why that is um, in terms of the pagan myth anyway. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, d- death and, and reincarnation, that's really, you know, something that I, I kind of think about every day, really, <laughs> death and reincarnation. So, um, you know, something that I try to, to teach my children is that, you know, death absolutely isn't the end, that it's just all part of the cycle. And that is a very feminine, um, cyclical view of time that isn't really socially validated in in our world and in our culture and certainly wasn't in my christian upbringing right so um so yeah it's it's something that uh, i think it's important to talk about and um you know and honor Mm -hmm. danielle i'm curious uh when you mention reincarnation because i feel like there could be many different ways to interpret what that means what does it mean? Do you, does one person's consciousness go into a, another body and kind of they're like the same person just reborn? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, of course I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know for sure. Um, but, but something that really seems to sit well with me is, is this idea of soul groups and, um, I, I, I think of it like, you know, when we die, we, we are just kind of in this great waiting room <laughs> where we're waiting for the rest of our, you know, we kind of do an assessment of our lives and whether we really met all of the conditions on our soul contract. So, you know, the parts of our lives that we designed, um, but then also really just waiting for our loved ones that, that were with us to, to cross over also. And, and so, you know, it always seems like, oh, you know, they're waiting such a long time, right? Like, oh, grandma's waiting such a long time for her grandchildren to cross over. But really, we don't know how time works beyond the veil. So it might not be that grandma's, you know, waiting for, you know, 50 years or whatever. Um, but yeah, that, that's the way I think of it. And then and then if you choose to kind of reincarnate, 
reincarnate together again with people from your soul group, you can, um, or, you know, you can choose to go your own way, or you can choose to kind of stay beyond the veil for, um, you know, a number of cycles or a number of lifetimes. That's kind of the way I think of it. And like I said, I don't claim to know that that's the absolute truth at all, but, um, that's the way I, I kind of am able to reconcile the different things that I do know to be true. So I do know that you know people tend to reincarnate together, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And I do know that our loved ones and our ancestors that are kind of more like guides, like spirit guides, that they really are just kind of holding space for us and that we can communicate with them. And so, you know, that's another thing that becomes very apparent in autumn because the veil does get thinner so, um, yeah, and then I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a, a million conditions to all of that, but <laughs> that's, that's what I've come to believe so far. Beautiful. When you, you said like a waiting room, I'm picturing Beetlejuice, the movie yeah. Beetlejuice, where they're in like the DMV of the afterlife waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what book it's in, but but I know that there's a, a book that I had to read during my mediumship training that talks about that, that like there's this this room where you're basically shown like your entire life as if it were a movie and you're kind of like watching it and, and you know, saying like, oh, I did a good job there. Or I didn't do a good job there. <laughs> and I don't know that that's something that I really, really believe in, but it kind of makes sense to me. You know, I, I do think that there's things that we set ourselves up for in our life. And, and I think that we do choose our parents to a certain extent. And, and there has to be a little bit of, um, you know, of, of like a, a looking down on this world from, you know, from another layer or another dimension uh, in order for all of that to make sense. Beautiful. Well, I appreciate you rolling with this topic because it just, we just found out about it uh, mm -hmm. moments before we logged on to speak together. So thank you for, for going there with me. Um, again, we are speaking with Danielle Dulski. She is the author of Woman Most Wild, Three Keys to Liberating the Witch Within. And I know that there are some connotations around the word witch. So what does it mean to you to be a witch? Yeah, so that's a great way of asking it. Usually people just ask what a witch is, but what does it mean to you to be a witch? Because that's everything. Um, so so I'll answer it the way that I'm usually asked it first, <laughs> which is what is a witch? So a witch is anyone who, first of all, practices witchcraft. So witchcraft is not a religion. Wicca is, but witchcraft isn't. So witchcraft can just be a practice. Um, that doesn't necessarily have have to have deity involved, right? So it can just be a practice of ritual and spellcraft and a kind of a cyclical view of working with the seasons and the, and the lunar cycles and all of that. And then the other condition is that you have claimed the name witch for yourself. So it isn't something that's given to you from an external, certainly if not from an external authority, but really from anyone. It can't be given. It has to be authentically claimed and those are really the two pieces so so you can practice witchcraft and I have friends <laughs> that are like maybe even more skilled in their craft than I am like really they they practice their witchcraft all the time and yet they won't call themselves witches right and so then they're not right so so you know those are the two real key pieces you practice witchcraft and you've claimed the name witch as your own um and now to me it's both of those things certainly but then also for me there is an important piece in there that that um really affirms magic as a conversation that you're having with the world about the values that you really hold to be true so which is for me and 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 uh, as part of my craft witches are activists right so you really have to rally against oppression right if it's a feminist spiritual system by nature it's against oppression so so there is this component of you know righteous rage and using your voice and and not just working your magic for yourself but also working it for the entire global community so you know which as activists but then also, um, which as, as someone that 
doesn't necessarily belong to a coven. So it doesn't necessarily only practice magic with other people, um, but does feel this need to circle because when you circle with others and they don't have to believe exactly what you do or work their magic in exactly the same way that you do, but when you circle with others that um, have claimed witchcraft as, as their practice, um, what you're doing is you're placing magic alongside the kind of mundane parts of life because any circle, what happens is, you know, you're doing the work of the circle, but then you're also talking about like the really day to day things like, you know, walking the dog or getting the car fixed or whatever. And even though that seems kind of unimportant, it's really everything because it helps you to integrate your, your magic and your craft into the everyday. And then it doesn't become just this other layer that you're kind of trying to fit into the rest of your life because in that way it never works. So, so the circle, even if it's a circle that you go to once a year, right, it's still, it's still such a huge, huge part of integrating your craft into your life in a really meaningful and authentic way. So it, it sounds, Danielle, like a like this circle is almost like a mastermind group for people who practice witchcraft. Kind of. I'm, I've heard of mastermind groups, the business mastermind groups. I'm not that familiar with, with what they do. They kind of bounce ideas off of each other, right? And, and fiercely validate each other. Is that right? Yeah, and, and just hold a space and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. it is, And, and you know, th there there is spellcraft in there too. So there's probably group ritual and there's like kind of a common honoring of, of the solar and lunar cycles and all of that. Um, but it isn't just that. That's the important thing. It's, it's never, even if it's intention, even if the intention is to like just hold, you know, a ritual for the equinox or whatever, it never ends up just being that because people come together and they're talking about, you know, traffic or stressful parking or whatever. So, so there's already just in that, that regular kind of communication, there's already an integration happening. And, and that's a really, really important piece for my craft. Now, there's a lot of people that only feel called to be solitary witches, and that's absolutely true for them. Um, and I'm not trying to, you know, dilute that or invalidate it in any way. I was a solitary for a long time and then I wasn't, and then I was again, um, but now I'm not. So, so there is kind of like this cyclical thing that happens in your practice too, when you go from circle to solitary. And I think that that's a really, um, healthy way to do it, but to not ever say, you know, I'm always going to be part of a coven or I'm always going to be a solitary. So you leave yourself a little bit of room for evolution in your craft also. Thank you for explaining that so well, Danielle. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about, you talked about spellcraft and, and the rituals. And, you know, I think a lot of people wonder, they see movies about witchcraft and covens and all that and the girls that are changing their eye and hair color or they're <laughs> making some boy fall in love with them or b casting some kind of hex on another girl you know so what what exactly I mean what kind of things really do you observe coming resulting from these spells that you cast Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, that's it, right? Like um, that, you know, the scene from the craft when they're they're doing the glamour spell and they're yeah. changing their eyes and their hair, right? So what's interesting about that, even though it's kind of like fluffy and funny, is that witches really do want proof. Like, like we really do. There isn't. It's not a, a spiritual practice of blind faith. We aren't just like, <laughs> we aren't just casting spells and and you know bowing to the moon and just hoping for the best. <laughs> <laughs> we really are trying to you know magic is all about agency. So it's all about um, affirming that you have the right to do this, that you have the the right to affect change in your world, right? So so if I'm working a personal prosperity spell for myself. Um, which I just did not that long ago. And I try to not do that very, very often anymore. That was some, that's something that I think like a lot of newer witches do is like they, you know, they get really into this abundance and prosperity magic. But what what's missing from that is, you know, does that does your prosperity magic really reflect what you want for the global community? Like, that's always the question. Does it share the same values? So that being said, if I'm working a prosperity spell, 
Um, I, what I'm doing is I'm trying to, first of all, have a laser focused intention on what I want. So that's the first piece of spellcraft. You really have to have a clear, clear vision and like know it in your bones that you can have that, like, like to the point where you almost feel as though it's already happened. Right. So, so there's that really kind of fierce, um, almost strategic mentality that you have to have. And then the second piece of it is energy raising. So you raise energy in some way, which can be dancing, can be chanting, can be writing. Um, but you raise energy to infuse that intention with that energy, right? And you can do all of those things in any number of ways. And then you finally release the spell when it's done. So you're not constantly coming back to the spell over and over again you know, hoping that it's going to come true quicker than the universe wants it to. Um, but, but undergirding all of that is the belief that you have the right to do it. The belief that, that you have the power to affect change in your world and to ha handcraft your world. And a lot of newer witches, when they come from like a, a more patriarchal religious background that was kind of disempowering like mine was, or it doesn't even have to be a patriarchal religious background because we're disempowered in all sorts of areas of our lives. But there's this, you know, there's that idea that the divine is external and that it's male and all of those things can be kind of disempowering. And then you're being tasked to cast a spell where like the, the main skill is for you to believe that like you can like direct energy to affect an outcome. And that's such a huge leap from being told that divinity is external and, you know, that you're going to go to hell if you, you you know do something evil or whatever. So so there really has to be like this slow kind of build towards spellcraft. It isn't something that you can really just like leap into um, without building up that sense of agency and and really believing that you have the right to do it first. Uh, but then going back to the idea of proof, when you cast a spell and it and it works it's like everything, right? When you cast a spell and it works, even if it works, you know, two or three months later than you wanted it to, it's still the most amazing thing. Um, and it is such an affirmation of, of why we do our work. And, and, and you know, that there are spells that kind of don't work and, and then you always usually can look back and figure out why that happened. <laughs> like, oh, I really didn't want that anyway kind of thing. Um, but when they do, it's, it's, it's always amazing. And that really helps with that, that autonomy, that, that self-efficacy building that you really need to, um, to work your spellcraft effectively. Beautiful. Thank you, Danielle. We're mm -hmm. speaking with Danielle Dulski. She's the author of Woman Most Wild, Three Keys to Liberating the Witch Within. Uh, maybe we should talk about what the three keys are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first key is wild rhythm and wild rhythm is like I was talking about the cycles and the solar and lunar cycles. So it's knowing enough about the way the seasons and the lunar phases, you know, knowing the way they kind of evolve and affect, affect nature, but then also knowing the way they affect you personally. And that's an important piece because we can talk about like, you know, these kind of common shared notions about what the new moon means and the full moon and the dark moon and all of that. But that doesn't mean anywhere near as much as what those phases mean for you. So my recommendation is always, you know, like learn the, the recommended times for casting spells and all of that, but really track your patterns. So even in terms of the solar season, so for instance, for me in autumn, I'm very high energy, like, like right now, well, it's why I, I, I had planned to move because I knew I had to move my house sometime this year. So pl I planned it in autumn because I know that I'm like Wonder Woman in autumn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have to sleep as much. Uh, I can get a lot of things done versus in spring and summer, I'm very heavy. Like that's kind of like my low time. Um, and I, that's kind of like if there's a time of year where that's very dark and kind of depressing for me, it's actually that it's, it's when we kind of get toward um, summer solstice when everybody else is really happy. <laughs> um, 
So it's tracking your patterns and figuring out, you know, when is the time of year when you feel restless? When is the time of year when you tend to feel really abundant in different ways? Um, you know, when do you feel like your sexuality is at a peak? When do you feel really creative? And if, and you, it is very trackable. Like if you can go back and back and back all the way to childhood and, and figure out, you know, what those patterns are, then you can use those in your craft and your magic um, and your sacred work in order to, to be that much more um, effective and powerful for you. So that's wild rhythm. Um, I have second, a question. Go ahead. To, mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt you, Danielle. Uh, yeah. About the rhythms, when you talk about the, the lunar cycle and our own personal mm -hmm. energy, I'm wondering mm -hmm. um, about hormonal birth control and mm -hmm. whether maybe this is a bit off topic, but I would imagine that that really impacts the natural rhythm of our bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, do many witches tend to take hormonal birth control or do they stay away from that? Yeah, you know, I think it's different for everyone. Um, so, you know, it's it's one of those things that, yes, for me, it absolutely did. And I was on birth control for... Um, more than 10 years before I had my first son um, and didn't even think about it. Like it was just something that everybody did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I didn't even think about it. And then after I had my first son, so this was a long time ago, um, then I didn't go back on birth control for a while. And then I got really into witchcraft, first of all, but then also like the way my cycle was affecting me and how predictable it was when I wasn't, it wasn't being affected by hormonal birth control. And I loved that. I loved that I could predict like, you know, like my, my, you know, when you ovul ovulate, you tend to have like a lot of energy. So for me, that was absolutely true. So, you know, you're kind of like a, uh, the mother creatrix when you're ovulating and then you start to become more like the crone priestess and more intuitive <laughs> yeah. as you get closer to, um, you know, to your bleeding time. So, so, you know, when I got into that, I was really, really into it. And I haven't gone back on birth control since then because, um, because I love to track my cycles. And when you track your cycles, if, if you take your temperature and you use, um, you know, these, these methods that they have that are really predictable, um, you don't need it as much, but I know that there's like a number of, of health conditions that kind of require it. So, so I'm not saying that, um, you know, you, you can't get in touch with your cycles if you're on birth control. Um, cause I know that a lot of women, they, they just don't have a lot of options and I'm grateful that birth control exists actually, Absolutely, <laughs> but, yes. but yeah, um, for me, it wasn't the right thing. Um, and yeah, so, so, you know, being able to track your cycles, however they cycle. So even if they're affected by some sort of external, um, medication or pharmaceutical, um, you know, just taking that into account, um, and, and knowing, you know, knowing yourself and, and that that's really the most empowering thing. You, you feel so much less crazy <laughs> when, <laughs> When you know that, um, for instance, for me, like day 20 is kind of my, day 20 of my cycle is kind of like my craziest hormonal day. Like I just, it's the day that I, I know for me, it's the day my body realizes that I'm not pregnant. So there's kind of like this, like biological anger at me for not getting <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> and and yeah, and so like I do get really like, you know, kind of punchy and 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 um and aggra more aggressive than usual, but I know that, right? So so I know like and it happened this past past month too because I was traveling a lot, so I wasn't as into tracking my cycle as I usually am. And I there was this one day where I'm like, what is wrong with me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I looked and it was day 20. I was like, oh, okay. And so like there's such a, a relief when you realize that that's what it is. Um so it isn't like a defeating thing. It isn't something that should put you, make you feel like you're in a cage, right? Make you feel like, oh, it's day 20. So I'm not even going to go outside today. <laughs> it should always be a liberating practice. This idea of tracking your, your patterns and your cycles. Um, yeah. So, so wild rhythm is an important piece. And then the second key is wild ritual and wild ritual is your magic and your spellcraft and, you know, your ritual as in marking transitions um, for different things in your life. 
So the biggest piece of that is knowing what your core values are and making sure that your magic really embodies those. So for instance, going back to my prosperity spell, when I worked it, I made sure that I also worked my, ma my magic for a dear friend who was kind of going through the same thing that I was and needed to invoke a lot of money at the mm -hmm. same time that I did. So I, you know, I called her in, even though she wasn't physically with me. And then finally, I, I added a layer where it was, um, you know, a, abundance and prosperity for a community that's pretty close to me that's really struggling right now. So it wasn't just for me, right? And and that's an important piece is, is your magic really has to embody the the world that you hope the children of the future will live in. That's what the expression should be in your magic and your spellcraft. So that's the the activism component. It can't just be like a small kind of isolated practice. And if you're you're calling on the energies of the universe, you're calling on the four directions and the the elements to rise and support you. So it can't just be for you. Not that that should disempower you or make you feel small, but it has to be for for something bigger than you right um and that's an important piece that i i think that a lot of newer witches kind of miss just because nobody tells them that like i know in, in you know out of all of the books that i read and then um the the little bit of um coven work that I did before I really claimed the name witch and started studying that wasn't a piece that was shown to me at all um and I was living in Florida at the time and and the deep water horizon disaster had just happened mm. so all of this oil was coming um to where I lived on the gulf and it and it was this really scary kind of ominous thing like like we knew that all of this oil was going to all of a sudden wash ashore and I didn't go because I had a little baby at the time, but all of the witches in the area like took to the beach in Clearwater, Florida and like willed and, you know, worked their magic to get the oil to like not come to shore. And as far as I'm concerned, it worked. Like we really did not have a lot of the repercussions that other, other beaches and other places had. And, and I really, that was the first time where I was like, ah, oh, that is it. Like, you know, witchcraft isn't just something that I'm going to do in my living room because I want to get a big check in the mail out of nowhere. You know, witchcraft is something that is a world changer. It is a, a change agent and it's a, a, a mechanism for, for feminine empowerment, which is absolutely everything. So, so that's wild rhythm. That's the important piece. It's, it's always having your magic embody what you want for the world. And then the last piece is wild circle. So the last key, wild circle, coming together with a group of, you know, what I call like-minded seekers or like-minded wild ones. So it doesn't have to just be women, um, but it's people that really share those values from the second key, right? People that really share um, the same vision for the world of the future, that really want the same things that you do, that really, you know, kind of believe in in whatever social social justice issues you really believe in, that, that really want to stand against oppression in the same way you do. Um, so coming together with them in order to, you know, talk about the everyday, but then also work your magic together. And it's not like, every single time you come together, you're planning a rally or something. But it is, th there's always that shared mission that informs the magic. And, and that's the important piece is, is that you, you really, you know, you don't get, your circle doesn't get lost as easily. Your circle can survive these different ebbs and flows and membership and, and energy and all of that. If you really share that common mission and, and set of beliefs. Um, so, so, you know, I have in the book, I describe different ways of creating a circle and, and, and different things that you can do for your circle. But it's, it's always, you know, kind of looking at, at you as a member of the circle as being layer one, and then the circle is layer two. And then the third and just as important layer is the global community or the world, right? So it's always um, working your witchcraft for those three different um, pieces. So you as a microcosm for the global community, your circle as a microcosm for the global community, and that there's no hierarchy. It's just all one, and magic really infuses all three layers.
Thank you, Danielle. We are speaking with Danielle Dulski. She is the author of Woman Most Wild, Three Keys to Liberating the Witch Within. You can find her at DanielleDulski.com. And Danielle, you were talking about our vision for the world and, you know, things just seem to, if you're on social media or you look at the news, things seem to just be escalating with the, the challenges that that our world is facing um and it seems like like communism obviously doesn't work we've seen that the problems that arise with that um mm. capitalism seems to be failing us uh on <laughs> environmental <laughs> levels on economic levels it's benefiting a handful of people uh and not mm. the rest but i'm wondering what is your vision for how our world could look and is it possible? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, ultimately, I don't know, right? So I have a friend that jokes, we joke all the time about like where humanity is evolving to. And we think that eventually we're just going to be balls of light that like bump into each other in orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not there yet. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, where this is all headed, you know, if there's some kind of... Um, like if if we're trying to meet these prerequisites for like intergalactic membership or something mm -hmm. <laughs> we're just like not getting there not getting there and certainly not getting there right now um the aliens are just looking at us and shaking their heads <laughs> recently mm -hmm. um but but so you know my work is is i really believe in looking at healing first of all as awareness and integration so the language of healing i feel can get a little bit diluted but but awareness of you know what the, the wounds are like the sacred wounds and then integrating those different pieces into like your outward kind of personality right um so, so this idea comes from the work of bill plotkin he talks about like, you know, harvesting these different pieces of your soul, these, these pieces of you that are really authentically you that we really bury early on during childhood in order to be socially acceptable, right? So like our shadows and all of that. Um, and I believe that a lot of the ills of the world come from that suppression. So, you know, right now, America's shadow is showing itself, right? <laughs> like all of the racism that is coming out now, all of the, the environmental degradation, um, all, all of that is part of America's shadow. So, you know, we have, we have ignored it for so long, <laughs> um, that it's just now erupting as like just this ugliest thing and, and really, you know, kind of embodied now in like one person. And so, you know, I was talking to somebody who who thinks like, you know, we kind of needed that, like we kind of needed this, this common, like enemy in order to really stand up and rally. So, so I don't know exactly why all of this is happening right now. I kind of look at it like labor, right? There was that YouTube video that a, a woman did. Um, she was giving a speech to the UN, I think, and she talked about like these dark times as being labor, right? That it really is, um, you know, America being reborn or, or, and not just America, right. But, but the world being reborn. And so, you know, we look at, um, all of these, all of these terrible things that are surfacing, these qualities that are, you know, right there in our neighbors and we never knew, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as part of like a birth process. So, you know, it's really painful. Um, and we kind of have to midwife it. So the people that are, are, you know, recognizing it for what it is, they kind of have to midwife it. Um, and so awareness and integration. So looking at the parts of yourself that you usually suppress, the parts of the community that are usually suppressed, the parts of the global community even that are usually suppressed, looking at those and then integrating them as authentically as possible. And so, you know, is it just right now that we're tasked to do our own work? Um, you know, I have a lot of friends that believe that they, they just believe, you know, they're going to be as authentic as possible. And then there isn't a lot of like outward activism or is it, we be as authentic as possible and we be as loud as possible, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is really my way of doing things. Um, 
But in terms of the feminine and, and witchcraft and, and the parts of the feminine that are really socially suppressed, you mentioned capitalism. So if we go to the triple goddess archetype, Maiden Mother Crone, um, and we look at Maiden Mother Crone as kind of just this living metaphor for these different traits that we really want to see socially integrated, right? So we don't have to look at it, certainly not in linear time, like we're maidens when we're younger, then we're mothers of childbearing age, and then we're crowns post-menopause or whatever. Not that, but looking at these different traits of the feminine and how they show up or don't, most in most cases, in society, so capitalism loves the mother, right? Because the mother is very productive. She is generative. <laughs> whether, whether she's birthing children or not, you know, whether she's mothering sacred work or whatever it is, she's constantly doing something, right? So, so the mother tends to be the qualities that are, that are very socially validated. They're the qualities that we learn as little girls um, if we're women, we, if we grow to be women, we learn that, the, you know, that's what we want to do. We want to be a good girl and we want to constantly be doing something that's, um, productive and is going to get consumed in some way mm -hmm. instead of the maiden qualities, right? So the maiden in our society is over sexualized in order to take her power away. Our maiden qualities are our emotional integrity. So like our right to kind of cycle. And, you know, I was talking about how I feel crazy on day 20 I have a right to do that <laughs> right? like that that's a maiden quality um, also our connection to nature and our sexuality and our sensuality those are maiden qualities so the maiden is very present and um, and in that she isn't like very a, a really good forward thinker like those parts of yourself that are maiden aren't very good at like planning and producing things so she's not particularly good for capitalism so our society has over sexualized her in order to take her power away. And then we have the crone and the crone is also not good for capitalism because the crone is very intuitive. The crone thinks in terms of cycles and spirals. The crone is really good at seeing like big picture patterns versus the sage, which is the crone's masculine counterpart, is really good at fragmenting and taking apart and thinking in linear terms and, and kind of looking at things really scientifically. So the crone, the ways we take the crone's power away is, you know, we call her crazy, which is what happens during adolescence a lot of the times when our um, our third eye is forming. Like, so that's when we really hone our psychic powers or we're meant to really hone our psychic powers and validate our intuition. But what happens is children start to talk about, you know, seeing the people in the room or the angels or the ghosts or whatever. And, and we immediately suppress that. We immediately shut that down as a society um, and, and so we completely invalidate those parts of the crone that are very much true, um, and are very much parts of the feminine. So, you know, how great, like, you know, talking about where this world is headed, how great would it be if we could validate those maiden and crone qualities and even those parts of the mother that are suppressed, if we could really validate those and then integrate those into society, like that is where the healing is. And that's really what, what my work is about. It's, it's not so much, you know, let's go a thousand years in the future and see where w this is all going. I have no idea. I, you know, I, I call it like the mystery, right? Like we don't know if we're all just fleas on a giant dog somewhere. <laughs> 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 but for me, my work in this life is trying to really harvest and then integrate those pieces of the feminine that have been historically suppressed. Um, because that to me is where the, the social healing and the change begins. Thank you. And Danielle, I'm curious, we're talking a lot about the feminine. Um, but I also get the sense that this is not about pushing away the masculine. This is about integrating the two. Right. Yeah. So absolutely. The sacred masculine if we look at that in terms of the triple God archetype and again, not in necessarily in terms of gender or, or these rigid kind of notions of deity, but more in terms of these different qualities that we would like to see integrated into society. It's this, the sins of the father is what I usually call it. So, so the sins of the father or the father qualities are really what rule our society. So we talked about the mother as being good for capitalism. She is, but nowhere near as good <laughs> as mm -hmm. the father is. 
So the father qualities are very individualistic versus the mother is very collectivist. Um, the father is very protect protective, kind of fiercely protective of, of property and all of that, very stable. Um, so the father really rules, right? So, so patriarchy is like the sins of the father. But then the masculine is wounded also. So the hunter quality, so hunter is like the maiden counterpart, right? And the hunter is very instinctual, very connected to nature, very instinctual, um, very um, connected to body, right? Um, and then the sage is is kind of, you know, when we think about like um, the, the, the <laughs> I'm trying to see how I can put this diplomatically. <laughs> when we think about like the, the ills of new age religion, right? So, so this idea that we are, all one and that we need to transcend the ego, right? So, so, you know, it is true, but then that invalidates our individuality and our selfhood. So it's not really good to just view spirituality in terms of that ego transcendence, which is what the sage does really well, right? So, so, you know, the parts of the masculine that are wounded and needed to be, need to be integrated are really more hunter, a little bit sage, but more hunter. So, you know, this idea of instinct and body and nature being important, you know, that's something that, um, the, the, the father as ruler in our society hasn't, has really suppressed kind of on purpose because it isn't good for capitalism, right? Um, those hunter qualities, just like the maiden qualities aren't that good for capitalism. Um, so absolutely the masculine is just as wounded as the feminine is. It's much more prevalent in our society, however. So, you know, in, in my work, working with the feminine, um, you know, those are the qualities that I'm really drawn to because those are the qualities that I don't see a lot in, in the everyday out there. Um, and they're also the ones that I feel like I personally embody really well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, you know, if, if I'm trying to be true to my soul, um, which I think, you know, is everyone's task, then, then those are the qualities that I'm trying to embody. But, um, yeah, it's never about invalidating the masculine or, or suppressing the masculine. Um, but it is recognizing that, you know, the masculine has, and particularly those father qualities have really been in charge for thousands of years. Right. So I, I, I'm kind of aware of, of this, even in women, there's this like, well, what about the masculine? And it's like, you know, absolutely, the masculine is wounded, but it's the feminine that really needs to be fiercely harvested and empowered. Um, and it isn't about gender either. It's, you know, we all have these different masculine and feminine qualities in us. And, you know, you don't even have to call them masculine and feminine. That's just something that kind of works for me and, and my, you know, theoretical framework is about that but if you want to call those qualities something else that's fine like you know call that that maiden sensuality something different it's still that that sense of um you know being really in your body and, and really touching things and usually using your senses it's still that that you're at we're after so you don't have to call it maiden mother crone or hunter father sage or male or female you know call it whatever you like um but but you know let's let's integrate those different qualities that have been suppressed and oppressed historically like yin and yang yeah mm -hmm. right exactly thank you well we are speaking with danielle dulski she's the author of woman most wild three keys to liberating the witch within and we're running short on time here. So I'm wondering where you would like to focus the last few minutes of this discussion. Um, huh, okay. Well, let's see. Uh, so, so normally, um, you know, when, and the reason I wrote this book actually is, is when women start to get a little bit into witchcraft and just a little, you know, kind of like getting their feet wet. Um, they always want to know like, you know, how, where do they go next? <laughs> like, or like what their most important steps in the beginning should be. And if we go back to wild rhythm, this is always my, my go-to advice is, you know, look at your life as your entire life as if, you know, from birth until death. So like go all the way to the end and look at it as if it were an epic novel 
right? And ask yourself, what is the title of that epic novel of your life? And I know that that's an overwhelming question. So I always say that it's okay to be vague. It doesn't have to be a really specific <laughs> title that it completely tells the end of the story and everything. So title that novel first and then come up with, say, 20 or so chapters in that book, in that epic novel, and title those chapters if you can, and pretend that you have lived up to chapter 12, right? So, you know, those first 12 chapters of your life have happened. So title those chapters, and then you can title the future ones also. But then in those first 12 chapters that you've lived, look for the moments where you really felt like you were the most you you could possibly be. Right. Those moments where so so I usually call them bhava moments. Bhava means feeling mind. So these moments when your body, mind and spirit were really yoked together in the same action and take an inventory of those. So we, what, what happens is usually during childhood, you tend to have a lot. And then there'll be whole chapters sometimes during your teenage years and 20s where you really feel bottleless, like you don't <laughs> have a lot of those moments and that's fine. Um, but take an inventory, the first 12 chapters that you've lived already, your bava moments, moments when you really felt like you were living your truth, right? And then look for the patterns, right? Because we tend, we tend to think of these moments where we really felt like we were the most us we could be. We think of them as like common shared experiences for some reason. I don't know why we file them away in our head like that, but we do. And they are very, very telling as to why you are so unique and your purpose and what you are here to do. So look for the patterns between all of those bhava moments, those times when you really felt, you know, connected and integrated. So common ones are like nature or solitude or community or sex or creating something, right? Uh, looking at sunsets or campfires or something like that. So take an inventory or swimming, Take an inventory of all of these different Baba moments. Look for the patterns, right? And then can you write the 13th chapter? So that next chapter that hasn't started yet, right? And since we're on the cusp of autumn, say that it starts on the equinox, right? So on it's September 22nd this year. Um, say that your 13th chapter starts then and how can you really envision that next chapter to include as many of those patterns as possible, right? And, and then if those patterns have a lot of nature in them, a lot of sense of the ethereal or magic, then maybe you really are being called to the craft, right? Um, and, and then what you do is you look for the elements that show up a lot. So if there's fire and sunrise and all of that, then maybe, you know, the fire element is something that you work with. If there's a lot of earth and you're like making mud pies or you know, mm -hmm. playing with ferns or whatever in a lot of your Baba moments, then, you know, maybe earth magic or plant medicine is more for you, right? But those moments where you really felt authentically, you are very telling as to what direction you should go in your craft, but really in life, <laughs> right? So if we look at our spiritual practice and our witchcraft is really kind of this microcosm of the way we live our the rest of our life rather than this kind of isolated layer, then those bhava moments are telling for both your craft, but then also, you know, your greater work, your sacred work and, and you know, make the next chapter have as much of that in it as possible. Wow, that was a really powerful exercise. I'm so grateful that you shared it with us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. I'm wondering if you have, um, it might be hard to pick the one thing, but just off the top of your head, mm -hmm. is there one big moment or big pattern for you that you want to share with us? A big moment. Um, well, I mean, the reason why I decided, I, I didn't talk about my story too much, um, but I I was raised Christian and I kind of 
realized that that wasn't for me <laughs> pretty early on. And then I, you know, I practiced yoga a lot during my teenage years and, and yoga was something that was telling me divinity was in me. And I loved that. And that was different from, you know, the way my religion was presenting divinity. Um, and then I got very into witchcraft, um, you know, after all of that. So after I had, you know, left my parents' home, I had lived in Ireland for a little bit and I had a kind of um, mystical experience, I'll call it, while I was over there where I really felt like I was kind of being held by my ancestors. Um, and I can never do it justice when I explain it, but that happened. And then mm -hmm. I, when I came home, I got really, really into witchcraft. I really felt like uh, like the, those Baba moments, I really felt like I was authentically me, uh, even if I didn't totally know what I was doing when I was, you know, working spells or, or even just learning about it. I really felt that, you know, that was for me. So I knew that I was a witch for probably at least six or seven years had been, you know, practicing witchcraft and knew that I was a witch versus, you know, before I wasn't practicing witchcraft, but I still called myself a witch <laughs> when I was a teenager. Um, but yeah, so, you know, practicing my spellcraft, knowing what, that I was a witch. And it wasn't until I had my first son when I was 25 that I had this realization that if I want him to grow up to be as authentic as possible, right? If I want him to grow up and not have to pretend to his world, right? To be able to really show his soulful qualities to as many people as possible, which I did want that for him. Then I felt a little bit hypocritical hiding this huge part of me, right? Because it was, it was a huge part of who I was. Um, and I was hiding it because it would be socially rejected because I lived in a pretty conservative part um, of Florida at the time. So I really did just totally be like, you know what, <laughs> I'm not hiding this anymore. I'm just going to start, you know, working my magic in the open and not worrying about, you know, putting my burning bowl away when people were coming over. And so, you know, it started out really small that way, but, but there was like this kind of strategic refusal like this conviction that I'm like I'm not hiding this anymore um and I didn't and and I've kind of been uh there, there was a little bit of a spiritual wounding that happened after that when I did become a solitary again but I I have always been like out there since then if anybody w was to ask me if I was a witch when I was 25 and beyond I would absolutely say yes mm -hmm. <laughs> no matter no matter where it was <laughs> So, yeah, so that was probably like my my moment of, you know, coming out of, you know, they say it's coming out of the broom closet. But like my moment of being like, I am not going to hide this part of me anymore because I don't feel like I should have to because I don't want my children to have to hide anything. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we say goodbye? Um. I don't think so. May, may I share my website? Absolutely. Um, it's it's just my name, so daniellodolsky.com, and then there's different, um, you know, there's I offer different w workshops and yoga teacher trainings, and there's an online course that's a companion course for the book as well that's on there. Um, and then just in autumn, I do individual online sessions also. So all of that information is on my website. And that's because autumn is your most energetic time. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, we have been speaking with Danielle Dulski. Again, she's the author of Woman Most Wild, Three Keys to Liberating the Witch Within. Her website is daniellodulski.com. Thank you so much to Danielle for being on the show. And thank you, whether you're male or female or anywhere on that spectrum, thank you for tuning in and for listening and, and for spending this hour with us uh, focusing on the, the, the divine feminine. And I want to send you lots of love. Be well. Namaste.